Hello, everyone, and welcome to Community Bookstore's virtual event series. My name is Hal Levinka, and I'm the event director at the bookstore, and I'm absolutely thrilled today to be collaborating again with our friends at NYRB Classics to welcome Dorothy Gallagher here for a discussion of her new book, Stories I Forgot to Tell You, in conversation with Susan Minot. While the pandemic has taken its toll across all of our lives, virtual programs like the one you're about to see have become bright spots in our days, and I want to give a huge thanks to Dorothy and Susan for taking the time to join us this evening. So to a little bit of housekeeping before we get started, you should be able to see and hear our presenters, but they cannot see or hear you. So if you have any questions, please click on the Q&A button here at the bottom of your screen to submit them. We will try to get through as many of those as we can at the end of the program. Uh, there's also a chat button here um, where I'll be posting a link to pur purchase Dorothy's book, if you haven't already, uh, along with links to Susan's latest book and some other links of interest. Um, a caveat for tonight's event and for all virtual events, we are all at the mercy of our home internet connections and server loads, so please bear with any technical issues that might arise. We'll try to solve those quickly. And finally, we've scheduled a whole host of spring programming for you. So head over to our website and sign up for our newsletter to stay up to date. Uh, next Thursday, one I want to point out, we're excited to welcome Hermione Hobby and Katie Kitamura for a discussion of Tova Ditlevson's The Copenhagen Trilogy, which is one of our favorite books that's come out this year already. Um, again, this is up on our website now, so head over and register as soon as we wrap up. So now a little about tonight's authors and we will get started. Dorothy's works include two volumes of memoir, How I Came Into My Inheritance and Strangers in the House, as well as a biography of the Italian-American anarchist Carlo Tresca, and most recently, Lillian Hellman, An Imperious Life, She Lives in New York. And Susan is an award-winning novelist, short story writer, poet, and screenwriter. Her first novel, Monkeys, was published in a dozen countries and won the Prix Femina Échanger in France. Her novel, Evening, was a worldwide bestseller and became a major motion picture. Uh, she received her MFA from Columbia University and lives with her daughter in New York City and on an island off the coast of Maine. So we are holding out for internet connections. So Susan and Dorothy, the stage is yours. Thank you very much, Hal. Susan. <laughs> So I'm so happy to be here um, to talk to Dorothy, partly because I'm on an island in Maine and she's on the island of Manhattan. And I wish I could be there in her apartment with her where I've spent uh, many lovely dinners. Um, Dorothy is an old, old friend just to, to um, tell you about our connection and was married to uh, Ben Sonnenberg, who was a early mentor, longtime mentor of mine and published my first short story in Grand Street. And so um, Dorothy is, is really like family to me, I have to say. Um, so, but the second reason I'm so happy to be here is that this is one of the and I'm not gonna cry, but I could cry because it's so emotional, um, such a beautiful book that you have written. So I'm so happy to share it with people and to talk about it with you. Thank you, Sue. <laughs> How are you doing there in the city? Oh, it's freezing cold. Wind is picking up and I'm stuck at home. <laughs> As I have been for the last year. Uh huh. Are Are you writing at all there? I'm not. No. Uh, I think I've written my last book, and um, I have nothing else in mind. Well, that's interesting. Having nothing else in mind because it sounds like, and I'm actually going to ask you maybe to to read the, the short little introduction of the book because it describes how these, how the book came to be, the book which is made up of, of these sort of short, I wouldn't even say meditations, they're almost like poems that are addressed to um, your husband, Ben. So I, I think this would be a good introduction to people if you wouldn't mind reading it and if you, can't get through, I'll pick up for you. <laughs> okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll read from the preface. Which was written, obviously, 
after you wrote all the other. Yes, it was the last thing I wrote. Mm -hmm. um, ben died suddenly on a sunny June morning in 2010. When October came, I sold the apartment where we had lived for the 30 years of our marriage, urged our elderly black cat into a carrier and moved us a few blocks away into the fourth floor walk-up studio that I had used as my office. In the months before Ben's death, I had begun research for a book, a biography. Now I went back to it. From early morning until early afternoon, I immersed myself in someone else's life. The remaining hours of the days and nights were dark with grief, but the time I spent on the book was a respite. I was so grateful to have work to do. Inevitably, the day came when the book was finished. The last line had been written, the copy edited, completing, completed, the proofs read. Still, every morning, I walked across the room to my typing chair, not to write, just to sit in the chair a while. For almost 40 years, my working life, my working day had begun in one typing chair or another. In the early years, I sat in front of a manual typewriter with a sheet of paper in the roller. Later, an electric typewriter, then a computer. To sit in front of a writing instrument to edit to write was the habit of a lifetime. More than a habit, an addiction. Those were hours when even the pain of a toothache would recede. I thought only of the work before me, full of inflated confidence that sooner or later I would be able to solve the problems it presented. I'm sure the Buddhists have a word for it. It was never my intention to write about marriage, widowhood, and grief. Grief is grief. No life is immune to it. And many widows have spilled their guts on the subject. But I found that when I was alone, I was talking to Ben all the time. I reminisced about our lives, reminded him of a yellow bathrobe I used to wear, re-argued old arguments, brought up old grievances. I apologized for this and that, and for that and that too. Five years passed and I was still talking to him. One snowy February morning, since I was sitting in my typing chair anyway, I began to type. Susan, your, your, your audio is gone. Yes, sorry. Oh. sorry. I didn't want to make noise while you were, while you were reading. Um, and then, so every piece in this book is, is you're speaking to him. Yes, not every piece, but most of the pieces. And I expect he is a listener in even those that are not addressed to him. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think there are some that it's about, there's one particularly, um, they're all titled, there are 10, 10 parts and they each have some quite interesting titles, but the one that's about the writing of um, your biography of Carlo Tresca is more about the writing of that, discovering that another man actually has been working on the biography for a long time before you suddenly think you've had this bright idea that no one's even thought of to write about this anarchist in the 30s. And it's all about that and meeting the man and how he's sort of unfriendly and and then it sort of ends up that you make a friendship with him and you finish the book, but you do return even at the end of that, which has nothing to do with Ben, you address Ben at the end. Uh, yes. Um, yes. Ben, uh, uh, Ben was there when I began to write the book about Carlo Tresca. And he listened to all my anxieties and all my kvetches and all my whining along the way. Uh, and he tried to put me at ease and he tried to be supportive. But then I found about, out about Nunzio Pernicconi who was writing this book 
and uh, there was nothing he could do about that. But, um, but Nunzio and I did become friendly and I tried to reach him not long ago, about a year ago. I called him just to see how he was doing and he had died a few weeks earlier. And that was, that was very distressing because he still lived in my mind. Um, would you like me to read that last paragraph? Yes. So that paragraph? last paragraph is, which, I mean, I, I, one of the reasons I bring it up is because woven throughout this book, you managed to tell a lot of different kinds of stories, stories about your past, stories about something that's happened to you recently. This is sort of the story of meeting a, a kind of biographical rival, but, but you always bring it back to, 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 to Ben, which adds, again, this other layer. And so, yes, it's on page 58. I wanna just tell one funny part about the story is that the first time you meet Nuncio, the, the, you, you call him on the phone and before he's, you've, you've had it out of your mouth that you're writing a biography, he says, mine is almost finished. <laughs> and then when you finally meet him in person at a convention two years later, it's the same thing he says, mine is almost finished. And you actually end up finishing yours before him. So that was a funny anecdote. Anyway, so, so, so the end of the goods. So this is addressed to Ben, the last paragraph. Now listen to me. I don't know where you are or who you're hanging out with. Probably you're having drinks with Alex and Edward and some pretty girls who luckily for you died young. But tear yourself away. I want you to ask directions to the section where they keep the anarchists. You'll hear them before you see them, still loudly haranguing each other about their various versions of utopia, trying to untangle the details of those arguments used to drive me crazy. These people were Nunzio's life. If you don't see him right away, he'll be nearby. He's a tall, handsome one. And when you do see him, I want you to give him a message. Tell him how much he meant to me. Tell him I always knew that he was the one with the goods. I do always think of them somewhere. Nunzio and Ben and Edward and Alex and all the people who have died along the way. I think they're somewhere. Yeah, there's a lot of talking to the dead here, or yeah. even the dead, people who aren't here anymore. Let's put it that way, right? <laughs> I think they are dead. <laughs> they are dead, but, yeah. Yeah. but they're, um, a friend of mine said she felt like there was a layer right behind her shoulder with sort of a scrim and if she turned quickly and pulled it back, she'd see all the dead people right there. She feels like they're- Yeah, <laughs> yes. Very, they can be very close. Those of us who are committed atheists all think that our dead are the exception. Right, there. <laughs> yes. Um, when we were, when I saw you last, we were talking about, you were talking about how you first started writing. And there is in one of the stories here um, called Royal We, about the typewriter that you had, you talk about how you, you sort of got inadvertently into magazine writing and, and how your mother like just couldn't even acknowledge that you were writing, like you were doing some work for a magazine, right? Yes. And how long, and, and what kind of magazines were those that you first started working at? Well, I was very lucky. I started working first on fan magazines. Do you remember fan magazines? Magazines with titles like Movie Worlds, 
uh, screen stars. They were, and it wasn't even the best ones. The best ones were slick magazines, slick paper. Uh, these were pulp. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, they were the cheapest and the least well-produced magazines. But I learned to write at them. I, I learned... Um, I learned how to write a story. I learned how to put an entire magazine together. They were wonderful days. And um, it was my Iowa's workshop. And then you told me, this is the story you told me last time, which I'd never heard before, about your deciding that you felt like you should try writing something more serious. Yes. How did, how did that come about? Because it's, it's almost like a, a girl reporter story. It's pretty good. <laughs> well, my mother, I, I wanted to please my mother. She didn't think pulp magazines were anything serious. Oh. And, they, <laughs> and they weren't. I was making up stories about Elizabeth Taylor and Richard Burton and Debbie Reynolds and Eddie Fisher, and they were all fiction, more or less. They were yeah. all based on some little fact, but they were all fiction. Um, but, and my mother once said to me after she read one of those stories, um, she said, um, do you think this is serious work, darling? So, so, and I thought too, I ought to try some serious work. Uh, did I tell you what I had written, what the serious work was? I've forgotten. Now. Yes. What happened was you were reading something, you read an, uh, a piece in the paper about. Oh, yes. The dam. Yes. I, I, I read a piece in the New York Times about. You were, you were like on Fire Island or you were on the beach somewhere, or, right? Exactly. I was on Fire Island. I read the New York Times. I saw that the Teton Dam had broken and flood and, and it flooded the valley and farmers and cattle and everything was dying and drowned. A gigantic uh, dam that had been being built for a long time a and huge suddenly dam suddenly collapsed. And I thought, and for some reason or another, I thought I should do a piece about this. And I called the Times Magazine where I knew an editor and I said, send me out there. I want to do this story. And he said, okay, for some strange reason, he said, okay. And I flew to Iowa. Yes, it was Iowa. I flew to Iowa. Didn't know what I was doing. I was a hundred miles from the dam when I got there and I don't, didn't have a driver's license. I couldn't rent a car and I didn't know what to do. So I went to the local police station and I said, mm, I'm here from New York. I've got to get to the Teton Dam. And they said, you're a, you're a young girl reporter. So a they, young girl reporter. And they, and the policeman said, one of the policemen said to one of the office, one of the other policemen, to take this pretty lady to the dam. And I thought, oh God. That's lucky. How long can I rely on that one? But they, but it, it, uh, they took me to the dam, and I wrote the story for the New York Times Magazine. And that was my first mm -hmm. serious piece of writing. Um, I realized I could do something more than fan magazine stories. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so let me think, let me see some of the questions I had for you. You, uh, you actually, when you first met Ben, um, he, he, do you want to tell this anecdote, which is in the book, um, or I can read the little section the first time you met him, which is kind of interesting. Can I read it? Yes, please. Okay. So this is from one of my favorite ones called pigeon in which many of the uh many of the stories or is it no it's not it's from pigeon season it's from royal wheat it's from the royal wheat and 
again, the, the you and is, is, is Ben, you're addressing, what do you do you asked me when we met? Oh, I'm doing some research for a book about this anarchist. So you're a professional researcher? Well, no, actually I'm doing research for my own book. You were quite severe. You're writing a book? Well then say you're a writer which is very like our Ben, isn't it, to <laughs> call people to task if they're not being either precise or undercutting themselves or, yeah. Um, so is there, the order I think of the stories ended up like, you, you sat down to that typewriter and you just wrote the sort of the things that you were thinking of, right? As you were sort of speaking to him. Well, um, I didn't know I was going to have a book out of it. Uh, I think the first story I wrote was Snow. I would say the best way to start a book maybe is with that. <laughs> Is, is not knowing it's going to be a book. It's like the pressure's off and you'll go wherever you want, right? Yeah. Well, I wrote the first piece, uh, which was snow. Um, because it was snowing. I was sitting um, at my typewriter and looking out at the snow. In fact, we read that first paragraph because it's a beautiful... Um, not just introduction to the snow section, but it also talks about, it, it, it touches upon how much of the book is sort of about things and how much they, how they can evoke emotion and stuff. So this is the very first thing you started writing. Yeah. Page 17. Yeah, I'm on the air. So often these days, I find myself thinking about things, not lofty things, just things, objects, stuff, things I have, things I had, things that once belonged to other people that are now mine by default, things I've given away, things that have vanished into the ether. Early in my life, my mother noticed that I coveted the goods of this world. She saw a flaw in my character. They're only things, darling, she'd say. They're not important. I thought then that hers was surely the proper, more elevated perspective. These days I would answer her. Not so, mama. Things are evidence. Life accumulates on them, like the snow that falls while you're sleeping. And then I talk about all the things, all the things that, that, that came my way mm -hmm. that I still have. And, and, and talk about them very well, I, I have to say. You talk about that sofa that you had and the old loft that you had it in. And you talk about, then you go into, um, some of your family and of a watch you had that had belonged to your mother that it was given by a uh, an aunt that you never knew you had and sort of get into some of the background of your parents who were both refugees, right? They were immigrants, they weren't refugees. They, yeah. Um, Yes. I guess I thought refugees because they were escaping. Oh, they were forced. they were leaving yeah. a bad life, but they mm -hmm. were not forced to flee. I see. Mm -hmm. um, and how, you know, so much of this book, and this is one of the things that is so pleasurable about it, is you manage to, in this very, I would say, kind of unsentimental, but direct, you know, often funny, very observant way, roll out sort of different parts of lives and 
different, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll look at the, the objects in your apartment or something you found once and what was happening that day and what you remember about the love affair that you were trying to get over or, and, but then it will, you'll swerve. I won't even say swerve. You, it will just go automatically into maybe a uh, memory with Ben or what's happening with the pigeons out on your terrace. And there's just an incredibly uh, elegant way that you have managed to, I don't know, it's a bad cliche that people always use, but weave all these things together that normally might not be side by side, but they absolutely feel like they belong there. It's like you're, you're bringing, you know, memory up against where you are in the present, up against this sort of lovely little anecdote. And it's, I mean, I just admire it so much. It's, it's not like, um, you know, I guess it goes under memoir because it's, but it, it's, it's almost like they're like personal essays, except they seem way too intimate to be called an essay. And it's just really like, like no other book that I know. It's, it's just- in, in, in this book, Sue, um, unlike other books I've written, I worked from sentence to sentence. Somehow the sentences were very important. I didn't know where they would take me, but I worked very hard on sentences as though they were pieces of sculpture. And I didn't go on to the next sentence until I had the sentence right. Um, well, that that concentration or that in, intensity of focus ends up, and you know, this one can say to all writing students everywhere, making it seem just like you just glide along and just are taken along. You know, Chekhov said that you know you're in the hand of a, uh, a strong writer when you feel that your wrist has been taken and you are being just led exactly where you need to go. And that's very much the feeling I had reading, reading these. Um, we were, when we were talking about this earlier, you had said, well, I didn't know where I was going with it. I knew the, the, the the, the person I was talking to and the kind of things that he would be interested in knowing. Um, sometimes you'll even say, you, you wouldn't care about this, but, you know, and you'll, you'll, you'll say it anyway. And you said that it's, it's different than writing about, for instance, a biography where you, as you had said, just fill it in. <laughs> Well, when you write a biography or anything uh, uh, that is not fiction, uh, you travel with a lot of luggage. You have your files, you have your research, you have, you have, to, you have to use it and, and figure out how to put it together. And it's, it's heavy work. It's, I mean, it's work, it's different kind of work. There's a file cabinet there and you have to open it and, see if you can find the paper you're thinking of. But um, what was I gonna say? So, so but, but with this book, without research. I was, yes, I was. I was draw, I, draw on a different place? I was perfectly free. I mean, I could, I could spend as long and think about anything I wanted to and spend as long on it as I wanted. I had no deadlines. I had no no no, no research to fit in. I had no, it was um, it, it was it was a good way of working. Mm -hmm. I like I, I, I liked it, and it was and it took a long time. I started working about five years after Ben died, and it took me about five years to finish. I work very slowly and um, 
and very, very thoughtfully and very deeply. It 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 feels, you know. Do you feel like? I mean, I would say, not just because it's your most recent book, and you say that it's your last book, but do you feel like that other you could have written a book this way fifty years ago? Oh no. No, of course not. I didn't have the material. And uh, just in terms of thinking, I'm not gonna, I'm just gonna rely on what I have to, I mean, that's part of it, I guess, not feeling like you have the material. Yes, yes, I've lived a long time and a lot of things have happened and I have all that to draw on. Mm -hmm. I, can, I have my entire life from my childhood through my marriage, I've been through widowhood. I had I had everything, and um, and I and this book uses everything. I think five years after my parents died, also I began to write about my family, my mother, my father, my aunts, my uncles, and it was a, it, a wonderful, wonderful uh, book called "How I Came Into My Inheritance," which is it's got. Well, it's, I won't say very much like this book, but it's you. It's you telling, exploring sort of family matters, right? Yeah, and in both books, both this book and the other personal essays or memoirs, um, the most important thing and the, uh, the only way to proceed is to find Find the person who tells the story. The person who tells the story is me, of course, but <laughs> um, but I mean, it's called voice, but it's something you have to search for. And I kept, I keep trying and trying and trying different voices, different ways of doing it until suddenly something clicks in your head and you know you've got the voice to go on. The person who's gonna tell the story is. Right, but then once you have the voice, it's not like it just goes flowing. Then you have to go sentence by sentence to make sure you're staying with that voice, right? Staying with that, that, that sort of... No. No? No, once you have it, you have it. You have the voice. You know who you know who where it's issuing from. And you can always get back to it. At least that's my experience. Yes. But then in the sentence by sentence like lingering, that's just to decide what it is you want to say or exactly the best way to say it. Best way to say it. Um, can I ask you to read one more part? Sure. Um, this is from, it's the one about, you're talking about how you used to be, uh, you used to take a lot of pictures. You had a camera and you took a lot of pictures when you lived down in the Bowery, the big apartment, it's page 31. And you, you talk about the joy of being in the, uh, a dark room and printing the pictures and how you take a class and um, who Lisette Modell says you have an eye and that's all wonderful. So we think, oh, she's gonna be a photographer. And then there's this long list of, of the, some of the prints that you have and there's an empty restaurant tables, a rag mop lit by the rising sun, hanging from a dirty window of the Bowery flop house. And you say, I saw that these images were studies in loneliness. They were autobiography and I'd come to the end of the story. Without deciding to, I walked my camera less and less. And then, if you read, this is just a, a couple of pages, but it's beautifully about what, what, how the camera sort of stays 
stays with you in, in your sensibility. A few days after Christmas in 1980, I went uptown to return a sweater to Bloomingdale's. It was a mild, windless winter day. The sky an overcast pearl gray, the air moist and fresh with a promise of snow. I walked aimlessly, window shopping my way up Lexington Avenue. On a side street, I noticed a row of black limousines. They were parked outside a church. Wedding, funeral, I stopped. In a minute or two, a bride and groom in full wedding regalia stepped out of the church door. At that moment, as if waiting for the occasion, large snowflakes began to hover in the air. The bridal couple made their way slowly down the church steps in time to the white tribute falling as slowly as the notes of a processional. A sudden breeze blew up. The bride's veil floated into the pearl gray sky, forming a net for the snowflakes. I caught my breath at the beauty of it. The stylized figures, the brilliance of the white gown, the black of the tuxedo, the floating veil all enveloped in luminous gray light. I didn't have my camera, but I still had the habit. My eye formed the photograph that might have been. I was filled with regret. Can we read the next part or do you want me to read that? Why don't you read the next part? Okay. I don't remember how I spent the New Year's Eve of 1980, but in January, we met for dinner at a Greek restaurant. It was our second date, but the first time we were alone. You had a discussion with the waiter about ordering our meal in Greek. I couldn't top that. But I told you various things about myself, about the book I was working on, about living on the Bowery, about taking pictures. And I told you about my recently lost picture of the bride and groom. You were quite taken, I could see that, even after I mentioned my taste for country Western music. <laughs> you thought I had an interesting, if solitary life. You thought I was in need of rescue. And only two weeks later, you confessed that it had occurred to you in the restaurant when scarcely half an hour had passed since I'd taken off my coat while my first glass of wine was still half full, that the wedding scene was an omen for us. So somebody wrote, someone, some, 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 somebody wrote a review that said I wrote charmingly about grief. <laughs> <laughs> well, charm should not be underestimated, as we know. Charm is actually probably the highest compliment you could be given. I don't know if he meant it that way, but I mean, this is about grief, but it's about, it's, you never talk about grief as like the thing that you're living with. You just describe how you live with it there. And it sort of describes grief in a such a palpable way. But it also, another thing I, I noticed in the book, Dorothy, is how it's full of surprises, like quiet surprise, just like that little anecdote there, you know, this sort of return to the the anecdote, but also you'd been talking about taking pictures and about the wedding and these, these little turns that are surprising. And you are very alert to, to, to noting surprises, like the surprise on the one hand that grief doesn't just go away, that here it still is. And yet, other surprises of, there's one scene where you're sitting with a friend, your friend Jenny on, you know, outside with iced tea and you look at each other and laugh that you now have gray hair. And you say something like, so as it should be. Like 
very much sort of accepting, seeing the surprise of thing, taking it in. I mean, it's just a, a beautiful uh, record of different ways of, of, of kind of engaging in both pain and joy and it's, it's really amazing. <laughs> it really is. I think that I've been telling all my students about it and I said, this is a book to read, to learn what it means to write elegantly and what it means to make one's own form out of the material that you have, you have, you're, you're taking out of yourself. Without, you know, I, th I think it's an important to note that you didn't decide before. It just, the story started coming out, right? Yes. Yes, uh, they came out, and, and after I had done maybe yeah. three, I thought, well, maybe I have more stories. Mm -hmm. Maybe there is a book. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Let's see. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was getting very practice, short book. and I yeah, but short, as we know, is harder than long. Short is better than long. Oh my god, <laughs> so much better. <laughs> um, and then when you wrote the last one, did yes. you know? No, I, you know, I didn't arrange them. They were written uh, as they came. And I realized at the end that I didn't know how they got, how they got put together, mm -hmm. how they should be put together. And I just laid them all out and looked at them and then I just shuffled them. And that was the I think I remember suggesting some order for you, in fact. <laughs> what did, yes, yes, talk, yes, you did. Talk about the order, yeah. Yeah. I, One of the things that happens in the book in the way that it's ordered now is that um, animals become kind of more and more a subject as, as the book goes on. Um, the animals that you and Ben had, the animals that he left behind with you. And they're, they're spoken of, again, unsentimentally. In fact, there's, for, for all the, the dog lovers and dog books and everything out there, there's a very good description of, basically you're apologizing to Ben for having replaced his beloved dog who died with a obedient, sweet, adorable dog that you acknowledge he could never love as much no. as the impossible going his own way, Harry. Yes, Harry was the dog of Ben's life. He was our first dog um, and he and Ben, Ben used to say, remember when we went to Massachusetts and you got pregnant with Harry? And it's true, Harry came very early in our marriage and, and I, I found Harry and he lived with us for 11 years of his life and then he died. And that was extremely sad for Ben. And later I got Daisy because, a Daisy and Bones, Daisy was the cat, a Daisy was the dog and Bones was the cat, although they were both the same size and both jet black. So they, they, they came together. They were they came together. They right? came together from by the way. I, 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 I found them there. I brought them home. And Daisy was not Ben's type. But once we had her, we had her. Couldn't be returned. Couldn't go back to by the way. So there she lived a long time. She lived 17 years. Um, and she was a yapper. I remember you'd come into the apartment and she'd go crazy. Yeah, yeah. she was a small little beauty, but a yapper, sweet, affectionate yapper. Mm -hmm. And um, 
Daisy died after 17 years, and but Bones remained. And Bones and I went off together after Ben died. And we had a few months together, just Bones and me. And when I saw that I had written about Bones, I thought she should be the last story in the book. And um, I wrote, and she died after a few months. And I stayed on in that room where we lived for another six or seven months. How I missed the comfort of Bones, her presence. I saw that I had fancied us as castaways on an island, lone survivors of a shipwreck. We had lived on board together. She knew what I knew. And I thought that should be the last story of the book. Perfect. Uh, well, with discussions of the last story, I figured this is a good time to drop in for some audience questions, of which we have many. Um, also, I have just been enjoying the hell out of Susan's cat, just stretching and moving <laughs> and lounging. This is the best cat we've had on screen since we've been doing this. Is good cat. What is her name? This is, this is Arthur. Arthur. Um, okay, so we do have a lot of great questions. So I'm just gonna start from the top. Um, I do see that there are some, some questions that have been answered already. So I'm gonna try to weed those out. Um, great, no, thank question. you. Oh, of course. Our first question, Dorothy, can you talk about the books and authors that influence the style of this slim, beautiful marvel? I can't really, uh, I don't know. I mean, there are certain, I mean, always in the back of my mind is Alice Munro, who was a magical, magical writer. Um, but I wasn't thinking of her when I wrote the book, but, but she's always there. I remember you said to me once about Alice Munro, how she just never did a flashy thing, right? That was one of the things that you, you really liked about her. Well, she never did. I don't remember saying that, but she, but she didn't. <laughs> um, our next question, uh, kind of for the both of you, can, can the two of you discuss the events of your own meeting? Um, this has been lovely. Yes, I met Su Susan in 1981 or 82. Oh, you can call me Sue, it's fair enough. Yeah, Sue. yeah I met Sue in 1981. You, you came to work for Grand Street came to work to for Ben. Uh, you were in your early 20s. After I came after I sold him, after he bought my first story. Ah. He offered me a job ah. there because I was, I was at graduate school at Columbia and I was waiting tables on the Upper East Side in some, you know, nasty Italian place. Um, and he offered me a job on Grand Street, meaning I could join the one other employee he had around the, the book laden uh, dining room table. Yes, yeah, yeah. We worked at, Ben did Grand Street from our apartment and Susan was in our apartment every day. <laughs> and uh, I fed her. And, and this leads to a, another a follow-up question um, about Grand Street. Dorothy, can you talk about Grand Street and how much or whether you were involved with that? Um, did it affect your own writing? No, uh, I wrote for Grand Street from time to time and would, would, would publish a piece of mine, but we worked very separately. I always had my own office and then filled up the house with Grand Street every day. There was no room for me. Um, and uh, it, it affected my own writing only by intimidating me. <laughs> he intimidated me too, believe me, yeah. <laughs> he seemed to know everything, but he would always, Ben was a real, he was a, a artistic enthusiast who particularly liked to show off his obscure knowledge of things, right? Like ordering dinner in Greek. <laughs> exactly. Um, our next question, Dorothy, how did you feel when you finished writing the book? 
Was it difficult to stop writing to Ben or do you still write to him? No, I don't write to him anymore. I still talk to him, but, but uh, our correspondence is over. <laughs> You've got a, more of a direct line. You don't have to like yeah. puzzle over it. Yeah. Uh, here's another question along those lines. Dorothy, wondering if you keep a notebook or diary or rely more on memory when writing? Um, thank you for this lovely discussion. Always memory. I've never kept a diary. I, do, I did once after my, when, when my parents were dying in the last five years or 10 years of their lives, I kept notes, I made notes. I, I thought I must remember this, I must remember this. And when it came to write about them, I, I had a huge, huge stack of notes. Um, but uh, that was the only time I'd kept a di anything like a diary. I wonder if that's why you remember things so vividly. Like, it's like remembering that the, um, you just were saying before, when we were talking before we came on, how vividly you still remember that bride and groom stepping off from whatever yeah. it was for 40 years ago, right? And- But you remember what you remember and the things you forget you've forgotten. So there are only bright, <laughs> shining shards of memory. Most of it is gone. Mm -hmm. um, further down the subject of memory, um, could you talk about how you and Ben met? Uh, you see, the, This question says you seem to be from different worlds, uh, but then you and Ben were brought, brought those two worlds together. Well, we weren't really from different worlds, uh, although we lived very different lives. Both Ben's parents and my parents were immigrants from the Pale of Settlement. Ben's father uh, became very rich doing public relations. My father ran a garage, but still Ben and I recognized each other when we met. I was, he, he said, always said I was like, his, I, I reminded him of his mother who was a very funny woman, apparently. I never, met, I never met either of them. They died before I met Ben. Um, so we were not strangers to each other when we met. Where was it? I, I'm not sure I know. In, in the apartment where we lived, uh, we were brought together by mutual friends, uh, for, uh, and Ben cooked dinner. He cooked, I was very impressed with dinner. He cooked two chickens for four people. And I thought, what? <laughs> Um, all right, we have two more questions and I'm going to save the best one for last. Um, this is, we covered this a little bit, but this is a, a bit of a different approach to it. And I, I myself am very curious about this. Um, so the question is, do you think that the tone of the speaker in these pieces or the voice as we were talking about is the same tone or voice that you shared when you spoke or communicated with Ben? Um, and if it's different, how is it different? I couldn't say, yes, it's my voice but it's also not my voice. It's also a, a, a much more consistent voice than I have. Um, it, 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 it's quite mysterious to me where it came from and how I knew it when I heard it. And of course it's mine, but not. <laughs> I believe that is the most accurate answer I've heard about voice ever. <laughs> um, and our, our last question, I know the answer to this because we discussed this in the green room, but um, last question, Dorothy, is that a photo of Harry on the table behind you? <laughs> it's a, it's a, it's a uh, watercolor of Harry. Could you show it to us maybe? Sure. He was a mangy, mangy dog. I remember Ben saying, for <laughs> someone who cannot walk, a dog is, you, you can never imagine how important a dog is to someone who cannot walk. Right? <laughs> yeah. And Harry was a kind of dog, looking dog, who made people smile. He was such a doggy dog. <laughs> <laughs> the best ones to have. Um, well, that wraps up our questions and our evening, unfortunately, but um, Dorothy and Susan, thank you so much for your time. This was absolutely lovely. 
Um, and just a reminder to everyone, you can pick up a copy of Dorothy's book in off our online website. Um, I did drop that into the chat and the link is just right at the top. If you wanna scroll up in the last 10 seconds that we have and click it and buy. Um, we also have links to Susan's book and some other events that we have coming up. But otherwise, Dorothy, this book is a marvel um, and I'm so glad you got to, to join us tonight and share it with us. And Susan, thank you for the, the lovely conversation. It is great yeah. to have old friends do an event together. That is the way we should be doing it. Yeah. Thank <laughs> you. It was a pleasure. Great. Yeah. All right, okay. good night, everyone. Be well, stay safe, stay healthy. Good night. Good night.